Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to see you all this week, and I will be <clears throat> sorry. I will be opening us up in a time of prayer and announcements. Um, for Stephen is hard at work upstairs, making sure we sound good online. So thank you for that ministry, Stephen. Do we have any prayer requests here this morning? I see we have a praise report for Ann Pleasance is back with us, and praise be to God for that. Still want to be in prayer for Margaret Fogg's mother. Margaret Fogg's mother, let's continue to lift her up in prayer as well. Mr. Arlene has injured her knee, so continue to pray for her as well. Well, if that is all, I will open us up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, how wonderful it is that we're able to gather freely here in the house of God, Lord. Lord, I pray we treat it as such. I pray that as we enter the doors of the sanctuary, Lord, that we, we leave behind the world, and Lord, we enter in a holy place to worship a holy God. Lord, I pray we never forget what it means to worship you with our lives, with our voice, with our words. Lord, I pray that we can be a light in such a dark world for the glory of you. I lift this up in your name. Amen. Now, as we enter a, a time of responsive reading, I, I would like to highlight the martyrdom of two of our Protestant forefathers, because on this day in 1555, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Lattimore were burned at the stake for preaching that you were justified by God simply by your faith in God. They were going up against the Catholic Church at the time, and they were burned at the stake for preaching how you were saved, saved solely by the grace of God. They had a problem with that, so they tied them. Sometimes they would nail them to a stake and burn them alive. And I want to share with you a quote that was said when they were being burned alive. I want to read it verbatim. He reads, Be of good cheer, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light a candle in England by God's grace that shall never be put out. And let us, Beulah, never forget the great cost of following our Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we're going through the Baptist Catechism, we see what went in to letting this catechism be written. The great lives that were murdered over the writing of this catechism that we can so proudly read together this morning. And this morning we will be in question three. So if you flip open your bulletin, it will be on the left side of your bulletin. I'll read the bold question and you guys respond with the answer. And the question is how do we know there is a God? And I'll be honest with you all, that is a beautiful sound to hear how we can in unity declare what these two people died for preaching. And I'll let that lead us into our missionary moment as we highlight a specific missionary and how we can be praying for that missionary who may very well be persecuted as well. So I'd like to invite Miss Susie up for the missionary moment. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I know they were just in October, but it's that time of year again for Air Christmas shoe boxes. So those of you who have done shoe boxes in the past, you're really familiar with them. Those of you who have not, um, we do have a video we're going to see in just a moment um, about the shoe boxes and how to pack them. But the big thing you need to understand is these are shoe boxes that you will pack and they will be sent off into all sorts of places all over the world providing gifts for children, most of them children in need. Not only do they get a gift, and in some children's cases, this is all they've ever received, whether it's pencils, uh, socks, a 
a toy, they're also going to get taught about Jesus. And they're also going to get uh, tracts and information in their own language for them to read. There are schools that they attend through this uh, process that they can graduate and they can learn more about Jesus. And in turn, they can share this with their families and bring them in churches are created through this program. So I um, apologize, a little mix up with the video today. So we're going a little retro today. You're gonna to see the 2005 video. It's pretty much the same video, but it is not gonna mention one important thing. And that is that you can also pack shoebox online which means that if you go to the website for uh, Samaritan's Purse, Operation Shoebox, you can choose to actually go through there, pack your shoebox, pick a box, put all the items you want in it, pay for the shipping, put a little note and send it and never have to leave your home. Okay, so that is an option you're not gonna hear about here. Um, but what we do wanna do real quick is give you a little illustration and also if you are interested in getting your brochures for the shoebox, some of the children are gonna come forward now. They'll be handing out the brochures. If you don't get one, there are more on the table back there, there are more back here. As well, if you didn't see it coming in this way, we have shoeboxes, cardboard shoeboxes. Feel free to take one. What we do want you to do is fill it up and bring it back. November the 6th is their collection day, okay? So we're gonna have the children come forward at this time, if Jeff could play some music for us. That needs to come forward, there you go. And then the brochures, like Charlotte and Christopher are handing out, if you guys want a brochure, you'll get to pick the age that you want, whether you want to do this for a boy or girl. There are restrictions on things that you can send, okay? As far as there's no war-related toys or items, there's certain things like breakables, glass, liquids, um, vitamins, medicines, that sort of thing. So they are restricted. They do go through them, and they will pull them all back out. All right, guys, you guys can go back, take the shoeboxes off, and have a seat. Play it again. Oh, play it again? Let's sing. Yeah. Let's sing. Children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. All right, so I guess if you would like to watch the video up on the screen, there's also a handout in your um, bulletin. So if you have any questions, just see me after church. Also, one more thing, please sign up for the trunk or treat, okay? Okay, yeah, let's watch the video. <laughs> I want every child to know that they are precious to God. And that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Last year, Samaritan's Purse's Operation Christmas Child collected over 7.4 million shoebox gifts. I'm asked over and over, Franklin, what is the most important ingredient that I can put in a shoebox gift. I tell them the most important item that you can put in that box is your prayers. If every person who packs a shoebox prays for the child that gets that box, can you imagine seven million plus people praying for seven million plus children around the world? What God might just do with all of those prayers as he answers them, it will be fantastic, tremendous, the impact that your prayers and your gift can have on this world for Jesus Christ. I want to take the next few moments and just share with you what God has done and what He is continuing to do through your gifts through Operation Christmas Child. How has prayer affected Operation Christmas Child? Operation Christmas Child started as a small outreach to help war-torn children in Bosnia. Now it has grown into the largest children's evangelistic outreach of its kind, reaching children in some of the most remote areas of the world. the past year, 
Operation Christmas Child brought hope and the gospel message of Jesus Christ through thousands of gift-filled shoeboxes. There were gifts placed into the hands of the littlest survivors of the deadly tsunami that struck South Asia. And children who survived the deadly terrorist attack in Beslan, Russia, received the comforting message of God's love as they received their shoebox gifts. Around the world, in the midst of war, disease, and poverty, these gifts, given with a message of God's love for them, have brightened the lives of countless little ones. Operation Christmas Child is bringing hope and happiness and joy to the little ones and families around the world. Operation Christmas Child truly brings the hope that there is in Jesus Christ millions of times over to children in some of the neediest places you could imagine. Throughout South Asia, many children and their families watched helplessly as the devastating tsunami destroyed homes, possessions and livelihoods. Nilanthi and her seven-year-old son Sheen lost their home, their fishing boat, nets and almost everything they had. When I saw the waves, I thought we were going to be killed and I was frightened for my son. While Samaritan's Purse was at work throughout the area to help families like Nilanthis rebuild their lives, Operation Christmas Child had a special surprise in store for the children. These gifts and the message of God's love were able to touch their hearts and bring a smile as children open their shoeboxes to find stuffed animals, colorful toys, and other presents. Throughout South Asia, these gifts have opened opportunities to share the message of hope found in Jesus Christ. Your gift is making a world of difference. The new graveyard on the outskirts of town is a grim reminder of the dreadful day when terrorists took control of the elementary school number one in Beslan, Russia. Today, many children and their parents still struggle to rebuild their lives after the attack. The message that Operation Christmas Child brought here was, God has not forgotten you. Not only were the gifts from Operation Christmas Child a welcome sight to everyone, many saw them playing a big role in the healing process as well. This is a tremendous tangible uh, way of showing that not only we love them and we care for them, we didn't forget them, but that they also are remembered by God. Wherever the opportunity allows, Operation Christmas Child is sharing the gospel story of Jesus Christ through music, children's programs, and through the illustrated Bible story booklets offered to children in their own language. And it doesn't end there. Within the last two years, in partnership with the Mailbox Club, nearly two million children in 53 countries were given the opportunity to participate in an exciting Bible study program for kids. Most importantly, it's an opportunity for local churches to reach out to children in their communities. Thank you, buddy. We appreciate it. Operation Christmas Child works because of your involvement. Thousands of volunteers, children, families, churches and schools. People just like you who want to share in the mission of Operation Christmas Child and will take the time to prepare a shoebox. We want to provide them with an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and to get a gift. It's for my children to just show them that the real joy of giving is here doing this. I volunteer for Operation Christmas Child because it gives me personally an opportunity to participate. Bring joy to all the kids of the world. These boxes right here are going to be shipped out as fast as we possibly can because uh, there are a lot of little children on the other end who are looking forward to receiving these boxes. And how did the shoe boxes get there? Operation Christmas Child is ready for takeoff.
certainly wouldn't be possible without those who take the time to pray. Because the most important ingredient in Operation Christmas Child is prayer. Altogether, it gives Operation Christmas Child an impact that is unique and unlike any other gospel presentation to children in the world. It's a privilege to be able to come and to give them a little gift and to let them know we love them and that you at home who have given these boxes, that you love them and that they're special to you as well. There's a special moment when each child opens his or her gift. When the child makes that connection, these gifts are for me. When combined with sharing the hope found in God's Son, Jesus Christ, these simple gifts provide a lasting way to transform lives. Your gift through Operation Christmas Child truly does make a difference, a world of difference in each and every life. Isn't it exciting to see what God is doing through Operation Christmas Child? The millions of lives that are being touched each and every year. We can only do this because we have people like you uh, who pray, who give those boxes, and who help us financially. And remember, the most important thing is prayer. Pray for these children as we go in Jesus' name. Thank you, God bless you, and a Merry Christmas to each and every one. I'm Franklin Graham. How blessed we are where on our Christmas tree, under our Christmas tree, we have countless, at least for me growing up, I had countless gifts. And I remember my first mission trip when these, these kids had, had no houses, they were living in torn apart tents and they were happy just to eat some popcorn that we popped with them the night before. It wasn't even warm popcorn, but they were just excited that we were there and the ministry of presence, but as they said constantly in that video that they can't be possible without prayer. And November 13th, we, we do the blessings of the boxes corporately, but I also want us to see the importance of doing it individually as we put each item into that box, pray over each item that God would use that item to point that child back to you. I'm reminded of a quote from the great Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon. He said, I'd rather have Ten Christians who pray on their knees and one pastor who preaches behind the pulpit. For every Christian can pray, but not every Christian can preach. And there's an important aspect in our Christian faith when it comes to prayer. So let's fervently pray over those boxes that we pack and send out as Beulah Baptist. Now with that being said, we will be in hymn number six, singing Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. So turn to page six. And we will open up in a time of him.
the great proclamation that is that we just sang. All praise we would render, oh, help us to see. It seems as though that's been the topic that we've been journeying through in our journey through Luke. And we're going to continue that journey. But before we open up our service to the preaching of God's word, uh, I would like to tell you all why this morning is extremely special to me. You see, over the past couple of weeks, we have looked at the interplay between man's free will and God's providence, how in our free will, we obey the will of God, we trust him, we submit to him, and how at times, even when we do obey and pray fervently, it seems as though our prayers are neglected. They simply aren't answered, but while it may seem as though our prayers are neglected, we have seen it very evident in Luke that God's will is still at play and how we ought to still abide in him, rest in him, no matter how hard it is. We must cling to Christ. And if I may pick on a couple people here this morning, I gave them a heads up, but this morning is special to me because there are four women here this morning that have spent years praying for me toiling and sowing the seeds of prayer and Christ-likeness into me, allowing me to be the pastor that I am today. So we have Logan, we have Lucy, we have Mom, and we have Nana. You see, last week we zeroed in on Mary being an obedient servant to the Word of God. And I want to zero in real quick on these four women and, and really bring it full circle to where we are in Luke today. Because while my mom did not give birth to the Messiah by any means, she gave birth to me and raised me. And without a doubt, I know that was no easy task because I was strong-willed, I was stubborn, and I was loud-mouthed. But I want to say thank you, Mom, for staying by my side and praying for me and loving me all these years. And Nana, for better or for worse, our family seems to compare us to each other constantly. And while they may see that as an insult, I see it as a great honor. Because while my grandma has her quirks, as do I, she's intelligent and she's a God-fearing woman. And I want to say thank you, Nana, for answering. You guys have no, many, no idea how many times I called Nana at midnight to help me finish a paper all the way through elementary school, through college, so thank you, Nana, for pouring into me and instilling this love for knowledge that is evident, I believe, behind the pulpit and in conversation with you all. And Lucy, my youngest sister, I find it best to apologize to you. For when I was given the news of you, two times I stormed out. The first being when my mother and father told me that they were expecting Lucy I was seemingly disgusted and ran, and ran out of five guys. And the second being, when I found out that you were a girl. I already had two sisters, I didn't want another one. But thanks be to God that he knew better than Alex's arrogance, and he gave me a beautiful, wonderful little sister that will hold me accountable to my word, no matter how smallest that word is. She will be sure it comes to pass. And Logan, lucky or not, for better or for worse, you've gotten to marry the product of these women. Those three women poured into me. They corrected me many times. They challenged me many times. They disciplined me many times. And truly, I am thankful that they did because it helped shape me to be the man that you fell in love with. And what an honor that is to be able to call you my wife. Because I know for half a decade of Logan and I being in each other's lives, I have not made it the easiest. But thank you for being committed to me and loving me and having this unwavering beauty that continues to shape me into a better husband, a better grandson, a better brother, a better son, and a better pastor. So Beulah Baptist. Last week we celebrated Pastor Appreciation Day and I bragged on you guys to just about every pastor I knew and you'd be surprised how many pastors were not appreciated by their church. So honestly, thank you for that. It made my week because it was an honor to be appreciated by you all. It was an honor to call myself your pastor. 
But if I may point your attention to these four women on the front row, they sit on the front row because I dragged them on the front row. <laughs> I aspire no member of Beulah Baptist to be a back row Baptist. Let's crowd the front rows. But I would like to point your attention to them because they have helped me shape the pastor that you all showed appreciation to. So Logan, Lucy, Mom, and Nana, or if you ask Gladys May, my Nana was my mom and my mom was my sister. <laughs> Big compliment. I would like to show appreciation to them as well. They're some of my favorite humans in this world. And I know Sandy back there, she has prayed for me fervently as well, so thank you, Sandy. And thank you, Beulah Baptist, for praying for me. Because the fellowship that we will see in Luke as we are traveling and journeying through Luke, in today's passage, we will see how evident the fellowship amongst Beulah Baptists is, how evident the fellowship amongst my family is, and how vital and crucial fellowship of believers is for the Christian life. So, Logan, Lucy, Mom, Nanda, Sandy, and Beulah Baptist, thank you guys for the fellowship and for allowing me to be the husband, the brother, the grandson, the son, and the pastor that I get to be today. So, with all that being said, I say that not as a means of sucking up, but genuine appreciation for being behind this pulpit today. And I would like to open us up in a time of prayer as we begin preaching and going into a time of offering. So Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that every circumstance you put us in in this life shapes us to the image of you, for better or for worse, Lord. We are sanctified into the image of you. Lord, I pray we never lose sight of what a great honor it is to call ourselves children of God born again, washed anew by the Spirit, by your blood. We are no longer living our old sinful life, but we have been crucified with you, Lord. Lord, I pray we never lose sight of what it means to be a Christian, of what it means to follow you. That in everything we do, we do it for the glory of you. So Lord, I pray as we open up into a time of service, of worshiping and glorifying you, I pray that you set our hearts right to focus on the glory and praise and worship of you. Amen. So if you will flip to hymn 149, the blessed Redeemer, we will open up in a time of worship with tithes and offerings. So hymn 149.
Heavenly Father, what a wonderful, beautiful truth that while you were wounded, while you were bleeding, you were pleading for us. Though, Father, we were the ones to cause those wounds and that blood being shed, you still begged your Father to forgive us, for we know not what we do. So, Lord, thank you for that. Lord, I pray out of gratitude for you have accomplished in our lives, Lord. We selflessly give back to the ministry of your word. So, Lord, instill in us a desire to give what you have first given to us. Amen.
feel like that alone should be our responsive reading, that Jesus never fails, because how wonderful is that truth that while your neighbor sitting right next to you may fail you, the Jesus we worship together will never fail you. And that just encourages me all the more to get up here and preach, because when I first started preaching years ago, I was worried that I was going to fail. And then Logan said, it's not about you. Get up there and preach. Do God's will for your life. He won't fail you. What an encouragement that is to preach. What an encouragement that is for our Christian walk as we obey him and trust him. He will never fail us. So today we will be continuing our long journey through the Gospel of Luke. And I laughed to myself, will we finish Luke or will we finish Genesis first on Sunday mornings or Wednesday evenings? We have spent four weeks in Genesis and we are just on chapter three. <laughs> We're on the third chapter in our booklet too. Uh, so that's a long journey as well, but in God's perfect interplay, they are lining up perfectly. And how encouraging that is for us on Wednesday nights and for those who miss out on Wednesday nights, I feel sorry for you. Please come join us. It is one of my favorite nights where I don't have to hear myself talk per se. We get to learn from each other. We get to discuss the word of God where each other's convictions really stem from. And I think that's one of the most challenging times of the week, but also the most rewarding time of the week for me personally. And I pray it's the same for those who join us. And every week we've had to order more books because we have more people joining us. And I just pray that more and more join us. I pray we have to order more books and put more seats in as we seemingly have had to do every week. And that's a great problem to have. But I encourage you guys to join us because it is a great time of fellowship. Now with that being said, last week I shared my emotional toil over the passage where Mary proclaimed that she was a Lord's servant and how that led me to question my own conviction, my own faith, my own obedience to the will of God. And it seems as though that toil and that conviction have carried on to this week's passage as well. Today we will be in Luke 1, 39 through 45. And right now I would like to draw your attention to verse 45. And it reads, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. And I ask myself, and I ask you all this morning, how seriously do you take your belief? How important to you is your belief in God? Simply put, what are you willing to sacrifice to live out your belief in God? You see, last week we saw how Mary, an approximately 13-year-old virgin, continued to submit to God because of her belief in God. Despite what it was going to cost her, possibly ridicule, possibly divorce, and most likely being stoned to death. That's what the will of God is going to cost her. Yet she said, boldly, firmly stood, I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me according to what you have said. And I want us to understand the necessity of our mission as the life of a believer, to be the Lord's servant. See, as Spurgeon once famously said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. And allow me to share a story with you all that convicted me to my core, and I believe it will stir us up to see the great cost of following Christ, to see the great cost of a genuine biblical devotion of your relationship with Christ. Voice of the Martyrs is a ministry I have followed for quite some time. It's a ministry that helps persecuted believers all over the world, whether it be a local believer in its own town, its own country, or whether it be a missionary that's sent over into a specific area. And they also put out a newsletter of who we can specifically be praying for, highlighting the persecution that individuals are facing because of their Christian faith. One article was titled, Pastors Suffer Severe Beatings at the Hands of Hindu Extremists. And by way of introduction, I would like to share some of that story with you. You see, there's a pastor, his name is Arhan. He was a Christian who converted from Hinduism, and he proposed to his wife named Radha. And listen to this proposal as he got down on one knee. 
He said, I'm a minister of the word of God. I've been attacked many times. He said, in the future, you may be attacked. I may go to jail. Sometimes we won't have food. Sometimes we won't have a house. Sometimes we will not live. This will be our life. For I love you, but I love God all the more, allowing me to love you. This will be our life if you say yes to my proposal. Now, if your husband got down on one knee, what would you say if he mentioned that? Well, Radha accepted his proposal without flinching, and her words were similar to that of Mary's. She said, live or die, I will live for Christ, no matter if they kill me. You see, since then, Radha and his wife and even his church, they've been forced to move three times in the past seven months. Arhan has been beaten numerous times, and he can't go to the hospital, for if he goes to the hospital and the doctors operating on him find out he's a Christian, they may beat him. So he's left to the tending of his sheep in his church. You see, numerous times he has been accused of converting people to Christianity under his preaching. And Radha, his wife, has personally been threatened to be beheaded for his preaching. You see, after getting married, Adha and Radha, they set a goal to plant four churches and share the word of God in 34 villages. You see, their, their work, though, was not welcomed by local Hindus. One day, a group of Hindu radicals descended on one of his churches where he was preaching, beating him in front of the whole church. They held the church at gunpoint as they beat their pastor. And they also forced the women in the church to watch as they assaulted their children. And knowing that persecution is a part of the normal life for, in the Christian life, Arhan now prepares the church members to face whatever may come, not with guns, not with swords, but with the Bible. He uses stories such as Daniel, such as the apostles, such as Jesus being persecuted. And he wrote, many church members have been encouraged. He said, now they don't have to fear the persecution. And here's what got me. They simply know it is a part of the Christian life here in India and they welcome it. You see, his wife and other women in the church agreed, saying that the persecution was difficult at first, for we didn't know when it would come, and we feared that, but now it has become a part of our everyday routine. And Voice of the Martyrs asked Arhan, why do you continue to believe in the midst of this persecution? Why do you keep preaching? And his response was very similar to that of Mary's as well. He said, I understand the burden of following Christ. I am called to live for him and not the radicals of India. These persecutions don't change the goodness of God, for I believe they show the goodness of God. They show I'm doing something right. I'm living holy and separated. These persecutions, and hear me out, Beulah, because this is what brought nearly tears to my, my soul. He said, these persecutions may break my bones and tear my flesh, but they will never break my spirit, for that is secure in the grip of God. You see, in the midst of this physical and spiritual war in India, Pastor Arhan and his church understood, as we just sang, the spiritual victory over salvation from our sin, that God is faithful, that God has already won what he said he would accomplish and win. You see, they understood the forgiveness of their sins in the joy of salvation that flows out of that forgiveness of their sins. That no matter what happens to them, they understood they are secure because they are saved. And that while India is their temporary home, whatever happens to them in India, they can rejoice because they have an eternal home that they can rest in because they are forgiven of their sins. They said, Arhan said, while we are persecuted in India, the persecution will cease in heaven. And just as Arhan's belief in God is evident in that story, so too is Mary's belief evident in verse 45, where Elizabeth says of Mary, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. Referencing back verse 38 through 45. 
So far, we have seen the belief of Arhan and his church and his wife. We have seen the belief of Mary. Now, Beulah, I want to ask you, as I ask myself as well, is our belief evident? Do we understand what it means to believe? And even more, does our belief extend beyond mere understanding? Do we live it out? Does our belief in the Lord throw us down to our knees in submission? Does our belief in the Lord allow us to eagerly say, as Mary said last week, I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. And you see, Jesus promises persecution to those who follow him in a holy manner. And one pastor said, sort of ironically and jokingly, but honestly, truthfully, Christians aren't persecuted because they aren't living like their God. Now, by God's grace, we will be in Luke 1, 39 through 45 this morning, and we will see some people of great belief in how we can, by their life, follow the implication that stems from their life. Now, I want to do a quick overview of what we have journeyed through so far in Luke. Now, we have made our way through Luke's opening to Theophilus, detailing what this gospel letter is about. And he says, I am writing this. I am investigating individuals so that you may be instructed in what you know. And then we then journeyed there to Gabriel, an angel of the Lord, a messenger of God, appeared to Zechariah to inform him that his wife Elizabeth is pregnant with none other than John the Baptist, who was prophesied back in Malachi 3.1. We then made our way to when Gabriel appeared yet again, not to Daniel, not to Zechariah, but to a faithful 12 to 14-year-old Mary. He informed her that she will conceive the Son of God. And we saw how different she responded to Gabriel when compared to how Zechariah responded to Gabriel. Zechariah responded with doubt and questioning the word of God through the messenger Gabriel, whereas Mary responded as an eager servant. She simply asked, though, how? She said, let it happen to me. I'm just curious how. I'm not doubting that it's going to happen. I'm just curious how I'm going to conceive a child because I'm a, I'm a virgin, Gabriel. How's this going to happen? But however it's going to happen, let's, let's let it happen. Let's live out the word of God. And Gabriel responded to her question by showing her how the providence of God can make all things possible and said that even in her old years, God allowed Elizabeth to conceive a son. And this leads us to where we are at today. And with this news, Mary quickly journeys to her relative Elizabeth. Many people believe her cousin. And we get to see the interaction here happen. So with this context in mind, let's look at scripture. And if you're willing and able, may you please stand for the reading of God's word. And before we read, let's go to the Lord together in prayer before we go to his holy word. Heavenly Father, this is your word. I pray that we treat it as such. You have said to us, God, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So, Lord, grant us this morning a hunger for your word so that we will not starve. Lord, soften our hearts and open our ears so that we would not merely taste your word, but feast on it, God. God, use your word this morning to save us, to draw us to repentance, to give us new life. Lord, I pray this morning as we continue our journey through Luke that you would not allow us to simply be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Luke 1, 39, all the way through 45. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside me. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. 
See, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God endures forever. This that we just read is the word of God. I pray he writes its eternal truths on our hearts so we can live it out every day. You may be seated. Last week, we learned about God's providence and how wonderful it is that this week we get to see God's providence at work this morning. This is a life-changing, world-saving, God-ordained meeting between these two women. Now, as we dive into this text, don't forget that this is fulfilling Old Testament prophecies, as we talked about last week. Some theologians even refer to it as the first meeting between John and Jesus. And our specific passage is what many theologians refer to as the intersecting point of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Because you see, in this house, the house of Zechariah, the Old Covenant and the Old Covenant meet for the first time. John and Jesus clash for the first time. You see, for thousands of years in the Old Covenant, Mary's baby was prophesied to come into the world to bear the penalty of our sin and save us from our sins. And I want us to notice the two babies here. Elizabeth's baby, John, was going to be the last prophet that would ever preach the message of Repentance for the Messiah is soon to come. And here in Elizabeth's house, John, the last prophet of the old covenant, will meet the Messiah who he will devote his life to prophesying about. Now, without further any delay, let's dive into our text. And the first point I want us to see this morning is fellowship. The fellowship that is had in this meeting. Look at verses 39 through 40 with me. It reads, in those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. See, we see Mary's response right away in verse 38 from last week. She believed in verse 39 of this week. She quickly, some translations may say hastily, some say hurried, but without a doubt, she immediately went to go journey to see her relative Elizabeth. Now, we're not sure as to whether she traveled alone, but she most likely had someone accompany her, or she was rather bold, because this was around a 100-mile journey, and for a 12 to 14-year-old girl by herself, making this journey would have been very rare and dangerous in this time. But despite our lack of knowledge on her travel arrangements, we do know that she wasted no time in going to visit Elizabeth, once again showing her quick belief, immediate belief, In the Lord, see Mary, a young pregnant virgin, knocking on the door of her pregnant cousin, most likely old enough to be her grandmother. We get to peek inside that door and see the fellowship that happened here. See, this fellowship isn't just two relatives catching up on what has happened, talking about family drama. This isn't just chit-chat. This is fellowship of them conversing over the miracles that God is performing in their womb and what is yet to come. These two relatives needed to converse. They have been called by God to fulfill the promise that was given all the way back in Genesis 3. They had no one else to rely on. They had each other. They had fellowship with one another. You see, in one sense, they needed each other. They needed this fellowship. They are in a glorious miracle, but while glorious, it is no doubt overwhelming for these two, one very young, one very old, both pregnant, both called by God to fulfill a prophecy. You see, the seeds of their womb are, in essence, the very words of God coming into fruition. The seeds of their womb will prepare the way for the Savior, and save the world. Do you remember a few weeks back how we learned that to write this letter, Luke was interviewing eyewitness accounts of what truly happened. I can only imagine Luke going up to Mary saying, Mary, Matthew and Mark, they've written their accounts, but they did not include these details about Jesus in the womb. They didn't include the accounts of Jesus in his younger years. So Mary, sit down. I want to interview you. I want that information. The world needs this information. Now, notice, if you will, with me, what happens when she arrives to the house in verses 40 through 41. 
They write down, it, those verses write down what happened in those days so that the people of God may know for certain this interaction between the two. So, I can only imagine Mary, much older at this point in her life, sitting down at her dining room table with Luke, and Luke is just taking in everything she's saying. And Mary in her lowly state said, Luke, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you about Jesus in the womb. Let me tell you about the younger years of Jesus, how at 12 years old, we left him and he was preaching, he was teaching. At 12 years old, we thought he was lost, but no, he was fulfilling the very will of God. So, Luke, interviewing Mary, as I said before, it's basically reading a manuscript of a 60 minutes interview that we get to see in the Gospel of Luke. And later on in this passage, we find out that Mary spent three months with Elizabeth. You see, when Mary arrived, she was barely expecting, and Elizabeth was six months pregnant. Now, some people debate as to whether or not Mary was there until John was born, or if she left right before he was born. We simply do not note. But despite when she left, she was there for quite some time. And I want us to see something special about their fellowship. These are two women who have deep communion with God. These are two women who are hungry to serve the Lord. These are two women who are well-read, well-versed, well-studied in the Word of God. And they have an unwavering trust in God. These are two women who are submitted to carrying out, literally carrying out God's will for their lives despite the cost. Despite the odd, the dangerous circumstances surrounding God's will for their lives, they were committed. I mean, think about it. They don't come together and complain about what God is doing. They come together and they worship what God is doing. They come together and they bless what God is doing in their lives. I want us to see a second point. The spirit at play. The spirit is, is at play working out God's will in these women's lives. Read verse 41 with me. It reads, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, do you see what happened? Do you notice who the first person to respond to Mary was in this passage? It was John in the womb. John responded from the womb six months in utero. Elizabeth is only six months pregnant with John. John cannot exercise rational thought by any means, yet he leaps. Why do you think he leaps? Why is this different, you may think? The Holy Spirit is filled in the womb. You see, the Holy Spirit typically comes upon us at the point of conversion. At conversion, we are born again by the Spirit, and the Spirit dwells in us at this point of conversion. But John the Baptist, quite possibly from his conception, was filled with the Holy Spirit. So John, filled with the Holy Spirit, leaps in his mother's womb because the Messiah has arrived. John the Baptist, in the womb, is happy, jumping in his mother's womb because Christ is near. John the Baptist, in the womb, is already being filled with the Spirit. He's already being influenced and governed by the Word of God. You see, what is John's mission in life? What is John called to do? He's called to prophesy about the Messiah. He's sent out to prepare the way of the Lord and call people to repentance. He essentially makes people see that Jesus is coming. He points people to Christ. Now, do you see what happened in verse 41? Even in the womb, John leaps at the presence of the Messiah. Even in the womb, he is leaping, pointing his mother to the Messiah. There's an old church father named Maximus of Turin. He writes, not yet born, John already prophesies. And some pastors refer to John as being the only person in the entire existence of the world to turn a womb into a pulpit. Now, Beulah, I want us to see the spirit at play here. Not even born. The spirit is using a six-month in utero to point people to the Savior. And isn't that convicting? That John used every breath to point others to Christ. In the womb, he pointed people to Christ. Anywhere he walked after his birth on the earth, he pointed people to Christ. Even in his death, 
He pointed people to Christ. And aren't we to do the same? Aren't we called to point others to the object of our belief? And how often, I ask myself, and I ask you guys as well, do we call others to repentance? How often do we point others to Christ? Which leads me to my third point. Last week we looked at the lowly state of Mary, and this week let's turn our attention to the lowly state of Elizabeth for our third point. And read with me verses 42 through 45. And it reads, Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside me. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. Do you see the lowliness of Elizabeth here? Elizabeth was most likely praying for a child her entire life. It finally happens to her. She's probably been praying for a baby more than Mary has been alive even. And Mary just shows up, possibly stealing her moment to shine. Mary knocks on the door, says, hey, I'm pregnant. And Elizabeth could have been angry. Elizabeth could have been bitter for stealing her moment. But do you see her response? She seems to be humbled here. She shows, she shows a sense of joy that Mary has decided to visit her. Remember her response. How could this happen to me? That the mother of my Lord should come to me? The Lord is coming to visit me? The Lord that has been prophesied for thousands of years, the Lord that was promised back in the garden, this Lord, he's coming to visit me? She's shocked that Mary, the mother of the Savior of the world, has come to see her. And later on, we see John Muir, his mother's lowly state as well, where Jesus tells John that he needs to be baptized by him. Do you remember John's initial response? He says, I need to be baptized by you? I need to be baptized by you, Jesus. I'm not worthy enough to, be baptized, to baptize you. And do you notice Elizabeth's response? She knows. She knows immediately that her young relative is the mother of the Messiah. Without Mary even saying a word, the Spirit is at play, making it evident that Mary is bringing the Messiah to her. And this provides for us a great insight into how Jesus accomplishes salvation in our life as well. Because look at this amazing news, how great this truth is that our Messiah comes to us, not based on our merit, not based off of our works, but based off of his grace, his finished work. God comes to us. Nothing we do can ever make us worthy enough to come to him. And how beautiful is this news that our Savior chooses us, comes to us to save us. I want us to see, though, that in all these people, from Mary to Elizabeth and even John in the womb, there's a sense of self-denial at play here. This lowliness is evident for all of us to see here. And it's convicting for me, because when we see this in Scripture, these, how these people of faith, simply wanted to be servants of the Lord. None of it was about Mary. None of it was about Elizabeth. None of it was about John. It was all about Jesus. Their entire lives were devoted about to Jesus. And thousands of years ago, these two women provided for us today an example, an encouragement, and a challenge of what it looks like to believe in the Lord. So, Beulah, we could, we could learn something from that. How we can make our faith evident. People should never ask us, are you a Christian? It should be evident. So, in closing, you may ask, how should I live for Christ? How can my faith and belief be made evident? Take a page out of this section, or the previous sections of Luke that we have read through so far. Look at the life of Mary. Look at the life of Elizabeth, and look at the life of a six-month in utero, yet to be born, already living for Christ. Now, I want to open up a time of response. And as we open up a time of response, I want to challenge the unbelievers and the believers here this morning. 
Like I said last week, the altar isn't just for conversion, not coming to Christ. It's for believers as well to get on our knees, surround ourselves with the word of God before God himself at the altar. I dare not encourage you, though, to act on mere emotion, but act on the Spirit's play at work in your life. Submit your life to Christ. And it's always encouraging for me. My grandmother, my nana, who I love dearly, for many years she had a white wicker rocking chair, and she would always rock me in there, and she would sing, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living. What was the rest? I was hoping you'd finish it off the bat. Your Nana, I'll be. And I would respond, I love you forever. I like you for always. As long as I'm living, your Allie, I'll be. And so be it true in our belief and faith with God that we love God forever. We love God for always. As long as we are living, God's servants we ought to be. And I challenge you all, how I used to jump in my Nana's lap and cling to her as she rocked me. It is that easy to jump in and leap on Christ. We can cling to the finished work of Christ, and we are secure forever in his arms. So I want to open up a time of response. Invitation hymn 307, Just As I Am. The altar is open. First three verses, or longer if needed. But I will be down front, encouraging, praying for, helping out any way I can. I pray we understand what it means that we can come to Christ. I would love to close this out with a benediction. Heavenly Father, your peace that surpasses all understanding, let it guide us, let it guard us in all that we do. May your peace be with us and evident among all that encounter us. I lift this up in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, so before everyone leaves, real quick. Sorry. Couldn't make it happen at the fish fry. But we need a new picture for the front of our bulletin. And we have people here and my mom to take a picture. So if we can congregate in the front of the church for a church picture, you don't have to be a member. You just have to be here this morning. Meet out front, and we'll wait for you to take a picture. Dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>